All right. Hello, and welcome to the video portion of our podcast. For those listening at home, you may want to check out our YouTube channel to see our wonderful smiling faces. Um, just a reminder, this is this is Science with Jess Phoenix, and I am really excited today. We have some super cool guests to talk about a film that they had a hand in making. Um, the film is called Hellbent, and with a name like that, you might think, oh, is it a horror film? No, it's actually about a giant salamander species called the Hellbender, and the efforts a community went through to protect this salamander and their local environment. So with me, I've got Annie Roth, who is a science journalist and also has a background in biology. And I have Justin Grubb, too, who is a biologist turned filmmaker. So these are some pretty cool people who have strong backgrounds in science, but who've taken it into a more artistic direction that also has social meaning. And I'm not here talking about discovering a new species. It's We're talking about a film. So I'd love it if either of you or both of you together could give me a brief overview of what the film Hellbent is about. Sure, I'll start. So Hellbent tells the story of a small rural town in Pennsylvania that was threatened by the installation of a waste water injection well for fracking. So when the fracking industry gets all their natural gas, they produce all this toxic waste, they have to find somewhere to put it and they want to put it in this town. Um, a mother and daughter in this town uh, heard about this and were really concerned because they get them and 700 other people in this town get fresh water from their local watershed. And the installation of this uh, injection well threatened the uh, safety of this well. These sort of wells always leak. So they didn't want this in this town. So they did fantastic community organizing to prevent this well from being put there. And it started this crazy sort of David and Goliath fight to protect themselves, but also the hellbender salamander, which is an endangered salamander in the United States that has very few healthy environments left. And this town was one of them. Wow. I mean, that's that's a great overview. And it's funny that you said David and Goliath, because in my notes about stuff I wanted to ask you, I actually put David and Goliath. So um, good job stealing my metaphor. That's actually perfect um, because it is. I mean, it's one of those classic like the little guy takes on the mega corporation and we have a, something change as a result. Um, so. I want to know, and this is a little bit directed at Justin, I mean, you have made the conscious choice to start a media company that deals with nature and natural world subjects. Um, so what precipitated this film? Like, how did you identify the storyline and and how did it all happen, basically? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. Um, because as you mentioned before, you know, I was a biologist when I graduated with my undergraduate degree in biology, I became a wildlife biologist and worked with a lot of really cool species, but one of those was the hellbender. And so while I was doing work, we were doing, you know, rearing and release programs with these hellbenders. And so we would go into streams in Southern Ohio and we would be releasing, you know, hundreds of small little two-year-old hellbenders actually. I have a little model for those video viewers here. This is about the size of the hellbender that we were releasing into those streams. It's so cute. <laughs> and, uh, this is a, a little 3D, uh, 3D uh, print that we have of them. Um, so when we would release them, we would look for, you know, safe little crevices and habitats for them to go into. And we'd snorkel and make sure that they um, were happy and they were able to find a good home so that they would situate themselves and uh, take to the stream. While we were doing that, we would be noticing a lot of, you know, activities, some natural resource extractive activities, like uh, we would be seeing pipelines being installed over creeks, and you would see the landslides and all the sedimentation in the waterways that would come from that. Um, there would be groups of people who were, you know, installing pipelines, installing injection wells, you know, in these big trucks and all of these locations. And we're like trying to hide what we're doing because we don't want to be like overt that we're releasing uh, state threatened species into the waterway. And so, you know, through those experiences working down there, you know, and finding pristine habitat became harder and harder because of the amount of activity that was going on. And, you know, 
I shifted to more of like a filmmaking communications position and years later, uh, I wanted to revisit the, that experience where, you know, there's this salamander in the water, you know, it's really sensitive to water quality, habitat that it's being able to live in is becoming reduced because of fracking activity. And we wanted to kind of tell that story to try to get people to really connect with that and understand what's going on and how it impacts their livelihoods and how it impacts the environment and the communities. Uh, and so that's kind of where the story came from. Um, and then searching through, you know, our characters and the people that we can include in our story. You know, originally our main characters were just kind of like the solution to our story. And then we sort of, we heard about their fight. We went and met them. We, you know, saw how wonderful they were and how they weren't afraid to speak their mind and started exploring a lot of the intricacies of this the story. And we're like, this is the story right here. It's this community fighting this specific instance, protecting this animal. Um, and that's kind of where that film came from. So a little bit of a long way, but uh, we finally get, made it here to create this film to connect communities around rights of nature to help protect their environment. Oh, yes. Amazing. And I'm going to ask about rights of nature as we get a little deeper in, because I find that to be actually the most exciting part of the story. Um, and it was something totally new to me. So, but to, I want to save it for a little later, because what I wanted to just get clarity on is um, at what stage of the the legal fight that the this community in Forksville and the surrounding area was going through, like what stage were they in when you two showed up cameras in hand, like we're making a film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they were, you know, they started this fight, I want to say it early, you know, 2013, 2012. That's when PGE, Pennsylvania Gas and Electric announced that they were like going to do this. And so it's been quite a while since that moment um, that they've been going through this whole process of, you know, regoverning and putting in rights of nature and their, their governance structure and everything. We kind of came in you know, sort of at the end when they repealed the permits to put this injection well in and, you know, that's, so we had to go back a little bit and pull some archival footage to kind of tell that backstory and explore like the things that they had gone into. And then when we came in, you know, it had been several months since um, the permits were rescinded and everything. So they were feeling pretty good about themselves. And, um, but now there's been a lot of developments in the story, um, since we've come out with this film that are pretty interesting, uh, that I can get into whenever you Yes. Want. Yes. Um, we're building, we're building. And, and Annie, did you have anything you wanted to add about the, about when you entered? <laughs> um, I, I don't want to give too many spoilers, <laughs> but, uh, I, the, the, at the point the film ends, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a success story. Uh, which is so rare in sort of a conservation filmmaking scene. Uh, they had succeeded. They had gotten what they wanted accomplished. Uh, but post-film, there have been new developments. While, they, while it's still a success story, there is threats. So we're trying to use our film to address those threats and raise awareness. That's excellent. So this this isn't one of those scenarios where, oh yes, we're looking back in hindsight and everything's finished and, and we've moved on and we're telling a historical thing. This is a very much real ongoing effort uh, and there are still threats to the hellbenders and to the watershed and the people who live there. So that's important to note. And I will just take a moment to say, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, go watch the documentary. There's going to be a link on our website where you can actually go see it and, uh, and, and spread the word because we need efforts like what is depicted in this film um, in order to protect the natural world that, that is so fragile. So there's my advocacy moment. Uh, <laughs> and so just, just to set the stage a little bit, so people who are listening or just watching and don't have the film on in front of them, um, what is that area in rural Pennsylvania like? And I, I've been out in that area because I have family from rural Pennsylvania, um, but not to Forksville specifically or to that exact community, but a um, little bit west of there and it is a very for me as a geologist it's very geologically distinct there's a lot of coal history in there and uh there's you know i know the topography but if either of you two could sort of give us a visual in our minds uh for what this looks like sure so grand township is sort of like a slice of heaven it's like extremely rural um so quiet 
uh, big rolling fields everywhere, gorgeous, uh, clear streams. Uh, as we were filming, some of the like things that I guess caused problems was like when, say there's a car going by, you don't want to film during that. We would hear like Amish carts going by. Um, <laughs> like that was the loudest thing you'd hear. It was, it's so nice there. Um, so we can understand why this community really wanted to preserve it because when you bring fracking activity somewhere, you're bringing truck traffic, you're bringing uh, all sorts of uh, infrastructure that's loud and dangerous. So I see why they wanted to protect it. It's so clean and natural. Um, and also for a small town, like every single person knows each other and like gets along, even if they don't see eye to eye politically, uh, they all work together, which we thought was really lovely. That's a yeah, I mean, when we were filming, you know, Grant Township was a really good place. We also filmed a lot for, you know, the stuff that we've done with Frack Tracker too. They were looking at pipeline installations and stuff and just like these really nice rolling hill type habitats covered in trees, lots of really nice forests in Pennsylvania. Um, it's, you know, they've got such nice waterways too and watersheds there. The water is clear. You can see the bottom of the streams and rivers and everything. And so it's just like a perfect place for wildlife. It's a perfect place for recreation. You know, it's a perfect place to have a community. And so like Annie said, you know, when they go in and try to threaten that, it's it's scary and you don't want it to happen. You want to preserve that way of life. And so you do what you can. I think I can speak for a lot of uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists listeners when I say, I mean, you wouldn't join an organization called the Union of Concerned Scientists if you didn't want to protect things like what you're describing. I mean, it's uh, it's bucolic in, in terms of how you describe it. I know from personal experience, yeah, that area is just lovely. And um, so, you know, I went into this thinking, oh, it's going to be so much about the hellbenders. This is going to be so cool. And it was, but it was more than just that. But just to, you know, center this on the salamanders themselves for a moment, can you describe what hellbenders are like? Because one, they've got an awesome name. And I love that you talk about that in the the documentary. Um, But two, I think that not that many people will have the chance to encounter a hellbender in their life. So I'd love it if you could give us a sense of what they're like. Yeah. I mean, hellbenders, like the name suggests, they're feisty little things. Um, They're pretty cool. I love them. They are the largest salamander in the Western Hemisphere, and they live right here in the United States. And so I think that's really cool. And what's even cooler is that you know, they're, for being so large, they can get up to about two feet long. Um, They're so hard to see because they've got this brown, mottled, orange, gray color to them. And they spend a majority of their life underneath rocks. And so they just live in this little cavity that's underneath like a nice flat piece of, you know, shale or rock that you find in the, in the river. And they just hang out there, you know, they, they eat, snails and crayfish and small insects and small fish that just kind of might be swimming by. Um, So they spend the majority of their time just doing that. Um, They're also a really long lived species as well. There's not a lot known about how long they live, but it's estimated that they could be about 40, 50, 60 years old. Um, You know, they may even be able to live even longer than that. And so, you know, if you think about it, you know, you say you have a 60 year old hellbender and you think about what it's seen over the course of its life, you know, it's literally has seen the Clean Water Act. It has seen the beginning of fracking. It has seen things that a lot of us have no idea about, but it's just trying to hang on in these streams. And so, you know, a, char- a big characteristic about them is they, you know, as all salamanders are, they're amphibians. So they're very prone to absorbing toxins through their skin. In fact, hellbenders have lungs, but they're fully aquatic. Wow. So they get their oxygen through their skin. And that's kind of why they have that like weird appearance. Um, one of the nicknames for hellbender is old lasagna side because <laughs> the sides of their, the flanks of their body have like really, really, you know, dimpled, crimped sort of patterns. I don't know if you can see that because it's a black hellbender, but you can kind of see like on the sides, it's really flappy, lots of extra skin that just flaps in the waterways. And that increases the surface area of their skin that allows oxygen diffusion into their skin and into their lungs. Um, So that's, you know, that's really cool. 
Um, and the males are the ones that guard the nests. And so the females will be in the nest, they'll lay the eggs, uh, the male will go in afterwards, fertilize the eggs, and then the males will guard them. And so, you know, when we were looking to collect eggs to bring them into managed care to help, you know, population rebound, you'd stick a little like stick underneath a rock to see if there's a hellbender in there and the male will bite that stick and try to rip it out of your hand and like vigorously fight and protect its eggs. So it's like, yep, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a nest right there for sure. <laughs> um, so that's cool. But to get the shots in our film, we had to go out during a very specific time of year. Um, that's like the hellbender rut. And so, you know how like other animals, males will fight like elk, you know, mm -hmm. there's that rutting season in November where the males will go at it. Hellbenders do the same thing. And so the males will go out during, you know, the first two weeks of September and they'll fight each other and they'll run around and they'll look for nests and stuff. And then as we were, you know, ending the filming part of this um, expedition, all the males just kind of like went into their dens at the same time. And it was like, right around, it, this is all anecdotal, of course, but right around like two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, my co-filmmaker, Michael Clark, and I were out there with our underwater housing, snorkeling around, filming hellbenders in the morning. And then all of a sudden they were gone. They're all gone. And you could see the males and the females inside the dens together. And then I had to take off and do something else. Michael went on to continue trying to film hellbenders and all the other sites, they were gone. So it was like that time they were done. Like it was time to, time to mate, time to fertilize those eggs. And, uh, that's what they did. And then the rest of the year, they're going to be pretty slow, pretty cryptic, just kind of hiding under these rocks. Um, so that's, you know, they, they're really cool. They've got tons of different nicknames. They've got, you know, w wizard, river wizard, uh, lasagna sides, hellbender, mud puppy, um, snot I don't know, Annie, do you have any more snot, Wait, snot otter? otter? Yeah. That's a lovely one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They got like kind of a slimy outer coating. And so, you know, it's like a wrinkled snotty little turd with feet is the best <laughs> way to kind of like describe what a hellbender looks like. But you know, I and think they, they're they, cute. Yeah. I, yeah, I thought so too. People. I was like, they're adorable. <laughs> yeah. It's like one yeah. of those, it's so ugly. Yeah. It's cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they got those little eyes and the big wide smile on their face and the little toes with the little white balls at the end of them and the little, the long like flagging tail, which is pretty cool. That helps them like swim in these fast moving streams. So yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty nice. They make little noises too. Um, when you're carrying them around on land, they make little burp noises and stuff. <laughs> so, they sound, I mean, they make a great. Yeah. I was gonna say they sound like little, real they characters. Sure like they're they're just like <laughs> such characters in their own right. And I mean, I'm sure you could have done a film just about hellbenders and not included the human part of it. Yeah. But um, maybe maybe that's later. Maybe you'll get a hellbender fan club going or something. <laughs> well, they definitely have a cult following. You know, there's like breweries named after them. There's beers. There's food. There's groups. You mean this? That East I have a hellbender T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's if you start going down the rabbit hole online, you'll find all kinds of cool hellbender stuff. Um, so they definitely have a cult following. So basically you're telling me there's a hellbender dark web uh, <laughs> that I need to go find. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so then I want to just turn the conversation a little to the human element because uh, I could talk about the animal side of it all day. Total animal nerd here. Um but I wanted to say, Annie, um, you know, you've done a lot of different journalistic endeavors, and uh, I'm sure you're no stranger to kind of coming in and assessing a situation on the ground to see, you know, what where is the story right now? So what would you say that the level of scientific knowledge and community engagement was um, when the injection well itself was proposed? Because I know you you obviously came into the process a little bit after that, but um, you, I'm sure you had to do your background. Well, um, I think that like, you know, props to the main characters of film, Judy and Stacy, because when the, when news of the plan to put this injection well into their town showed up, they didn't know anything about that. They there had been fracking activity in their general area before, but they weren't familiar with um, the threats posed by injection wells. So they did super hard research, um, enough that they could communicate it to the rest of the people in their township because um, Judy is an elected township official. So they 
she meets with everyone in her township regularly. So they did tons of research. They were able to communicate their concerns. And they also had people from uh, Pennsylvania General Energy come in and do a Q&A so they could ask them about these things that they had read online. They had seen all these news stories about other towns having, um, you know, pipelines explode or uh, injection wells leak. And they're like, okay, well, how are you going to practice from this? Like, is this something we're, should we be concerned about? And all their concerns were dismissed. They were just basically ignored. They weren't answering the questions. So they knew they pretty much had to take this whole thing into their own hands. Like no one was going to help them. They had to community organize. They had to find people to support them um, and like really learn as much as they possibly could because they're, you know, there's a mother and daughter who have never dealt with legal stuff before. Um, one was a teacher and was, the other one's a graphic designer. Perfectly wonderful, but they're not lawyers all day. Like <laughs> <laughs> the lawyers that work with them are like experts in like community led environmental cases. And they, you know, they work collaboratively. So um, it was all new to everyone who started. And by the end, they were really experts. So then, okay. So you made me realize that we do need to give a quick explanation of fracking. And so just my, you know, geology background here, correct me or add nuance as you, uh, as needed. Um, but basically when you frack, you're trying to extract uh, natural gas from underground that's contained in different rock layers um, that are known to be gas rich. So, the process involves injecting fluids, special, sometimes proprietary mixtures of fluids into the earth uh, in order to force that gas up and fracking. It comes from the term hydraulic fracturing. You're using a fluid to break the rock to release that gas for human consumption, but there's waste produced and you have to get rid of that waste. And we don't really have environmentally friendly ways of doing that, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, and so they use these things called injection wells, which do what they sound like. You inject the waste from fracking down back into the subsurface of, of the earth. Um, does that about explain fracking and injection wells? That's a great explanation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a yeah, perfect that's, explanation. Yeah. There's um, 1.7 million wells um, in the U.S., um, and there's, oh, hold on, I have this number right here. Um, where is it? Um, Don't worry. Whatever. There's like, we'll edit the ums. <laughs> there's a ton. Yeah. <laughs> there's a ton of waste injection wells as well. Not as many as the same wells. Um, hold on, let me just get an edit. This I will. I will find the exact on number. online people. Yeah. People get to watch the video still. This is the video is unedited, <laughs> but <laughs> nah, yeah. but the, but for the it's podcast, it will be. <laughs> yeah, um. <laughs> I think I have your number. You were going to talk about like six hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Okay. Wells. So the six hundred and eighty thousand injection wells. Twenty percent of injection wells have some sort of structural problem. They leak. They um, don't work as they're supposed to, something's wrong with them. Um, and a new study by the Yale School of Public Health found that young children living near like fracking wells are three times more likely to develop leukemia. And that's like a super solid study. That's, so like everything else we say, yeah. remember that, <laughs> that's right? Alarming. So even just being near one, <laughs> yeah, even being near one that's working puts you at risk. So when you do put all the waste back in the ground in these wells, um, you're putting a couple things at risk. So you're putting the groundwater at risk because it could leak into the groundwater, but you're also putting like the topsoil because if it leaks, it can just contaminate all the soil. And this actually happened recently near Grant Township. Pennsylvania General Energy uh, had a gas well that leaked a mile from Grant Township and they uh, had to take out 1,600 tons of soil and just dump it in the landfill. And they like didn't tell anyone they were doing it until it basically was after it was done. So there's many different ways this can go wrong. Um, wow. And it's really like not a great solution for dumping this waste. There's not a million alternative ways to get rid of the waste, but this is not a great solution. Right. And, you know, anybody who is even has a basic education in environmental science knows that um, it's all connected. Everything from microbes to clouds, uh, it, it's all interrelated. And 
you cannot manipulate one part of an environment and expect it to stay in isolation. I mean, these are, there's feedbacks. There's so many feedbacks. There's so many loops. And I describe environments as a series of interconnected Venn diagrams. Um, and, and it's basically like a Venn diagrammer's field day anytime you go into an environment. So it makes perfect sense why a community would say, you know what? We have these great hellbenders and this lovely clean water, and we do like to drink lovely clean water. We don't want an injection well. So understandable. It is very much like not in my backyard, but I think a lot of times not in my backyard, there's a good reason for it. <laughs> and it almost should be with certain things, not anywhere, <laughs> not in anyone's backyard. Um, and so ugh, the kid's leukemia stat is still blowing my mind. I'm going to be chewing on that one for a while. Um, but I want to ask essentially... So we know that the whole David and Goliath story, we get that, um, you know, especially here in the U.S., we love that, you know, little guy takes on the big guy and has a win. And uh, I think it's I think as humans, we're wired to appreciate that sort of story. But what really grabbed my attention and what made me say I have to cover this for for this is science is that um, rights of nature. So now now we're here and I really I like all this is building up to. Rights of nature, this seems to be, to me, um, and I'm not going to explain it. I want you two to explain it. But to me, this seems like one of the most exciting, um, I'd say, legal instruments available, uh, new legal instruments, relatively speaking, um, for court action, for like actual legal frameworks that we can set up to protect you know, areas or species or communities or in just environments, ecosystems. So tell us, rights of nature, <laughs> whoever wants to go about this one. <sighs> I'll, I'll talk about it. So as human beings, you know, pretty much universally, we've decided we're entitled to a certain set of rights. Um, the idea of rights of nature is that species and ecosystems should also be entitled to a certain set of rights. So the idea that ecosystems and species have the right to flourish and that people should be able to defend those rights in court is all what rights of nature is about. So it's not a new idea. Um, there are rights of nature's laws internationally and here at home in the United States. Um, but in the United States, they've not really been tested and those that have get overturned a lot. While it's doing well overseas, like Ecuador has it in their constitution, uh, Canada has it for certain um, uh, watersheds, it is not going great in the United States. Like Lake Erie had a Bill of Rights, for example, and it passed and it was fantastic, but then they tested it and overturned it. And that's kind of what's happening in Grant Township. We'll get to that. But um, basically what our film is letting people know about and what we honestly want people to try and run with is this idea that humans, like our health and the environment's health are deeply connected. So if you're threatening the environment that I live in, you're threatening my health. So if I should be able to defend my environment in court just as much as if you were threatening the people I live next to. So that's like the whole idea. It has commonality with a lot of indigenous worldviews. It has commonality with like a lot of religions and honestly, like with human rights, it's just applied to the environment. Uh, it makes sense to me, but I can see how... It's funny, sometimes these things that seem like they should be obvious take a while to enter public consciousness. It's just, you know, it's one of the flaws of our species. <laughs> it's like, well, of course, of course. But it, it's so mind blowing to, to hear that the, the folks there in Grant Township and that community were actually able to, I'm sure, work with their attorneys to employ this rights of nature framework and, and actually score some points for themselves uh, and for, for protecting themselves and the hellbenders. Um, so do you think that this is something that is going to stand up to future legal challenges, which probably is where you were going? <laughs> um, I think that if Grant Township is successful in their fight to uh, maintain what they've done with rights of nature, because they passed the rights of nature law and it worked. It's being threatened now, but if they're able to keep it on the books, it will set a precedent for other places to try the same thing. For example, there's another uh, community uh, in Pennsylvania called Plum, and they're doing the exact same thing. They don't want injection well in the community. They they came together, community organized, and were like, no, we do not want this. And they're facing a legal fight. We want places like that to do this. While not everywhere is governed the same way as Pennsylvania, where they were allowed to do a home rule charter, which means like, they're small enough that they can govern themselves to a certain extent. Um, 
there are ways to use small scale community organizing to protect aspects of the environment. Everything from like a homeowner association to like, you know, a city council. If you come together and give, you know, rights to be a stream, an entire watershed, a meadow, uh, later when those things are threatened, you can mount a challenge. So it's no guarantee that it will stay. A lot of rights of nature laws have been overturned because our legal system is built on the idea that nature is property. So when you try and challenge that, there's a million existing laws being like, no, whoever owns it can do whatever they want to. It doesn't matter who lives there, who relies on it, who it affects. So we want more people to try and do this because the more people who do it, the more precedence will be set, the more normal it will become, and then there will be less sort of uh, tipping of the scales. Like We want it to be a balanced fight between, okay, lots of people want to give rights of nature laws. And they're not fighting against a bazillion laws that say that's not feasible. Right. And I think if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it totally does. And um, I think it's really important that you mentioned precedent because um, American courts are so fixated on precedent. Has this been done before? You know, is there a justification in the past for, for acting this way? And I know that it's very important to cite prior court cases in, you know, court decisions. So I think, um, I think you've got... Uh, I think you've got something here that is very special. Um, and and I just want to make clear about, I really want to come back to the people who are organizing to do this home rule charter, which I'm sure a lot of people have never heard of. Um, but they, they said, okay, we can govern ourselves. Um, and then also to extend this and employ rights of nature as a legal strategy. Um, these are not lawyers, like you said, and they're not scientists, right? I mean, just tell, tell me about the demographics of people who came together to make this happen. Yeah. So, um, Grant Township has like a diverse array of people. Um, a lot of like sort of, uh, you know, people who have, maybe they're not rich. Most of them are not. <laughs> I'd say all of them are not. Um, just like want to live a nice quiet life in this place. Um, and they really had to like put on their legal hats to do this because they realized that no one else was going to help them. Fortunately, they were helped by a group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. But all the things that they did to succeed um, using rights of nature was a community led. So their home rule charter was completely, they wrote it themselves as a community. They all, you know, constantly had meetings and organizing and all that kind of stuff. What, where the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund came in was like funding their legal fights in the courts when they were being constantly sued by um, the fracking company and the Defend- uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. So they had to do like big time court cases. They also had to like build their own legal sort of framework in their community. So while they did have a lot of help, it was the foundation of the success was community organizing. So then I also remember from the film that uh, they, 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 the people did mention that the EPA did not help them. Um, so can you can you elaborate on that just a bit? Because I, you know, as your, it, let's say I wasn't a scientist, as your average person, I'd be like, well, isn't the EPA going to do something about this? Um, so so why wouldn't the EPA have helped this community? Yeah, for so for this situation, um, the EPA granted the permit to Pennsylvania Gas and Electric to install the injection well which they had felt that, you know, if the EPA was on the community side, that they would not have granted that permit. And so their frustration lies with the fact that the EPA was going to go ahead and allow that to happen and not do more to help protect the community. Now, it's important to note that this was the EPA of a previous administration. So we don't know what it may have looked like if this was a situation that was happening now or even prior to that previous administration. But we do know that that was what was happening at the time. And so they were just really frustrated with the lack of support that they got. And so there was a permit that was issued by the EPA to allow it. And then there was a permit issued by um, the Department of Environmental Protection in EPA to allow the installation of the injection well. And so what, what was interesting is like Annie mentioned, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection is the one who gave the permit, 
They're also the one who rescinded the permit based on the Home Rule Charter, where they wrote rights of nature into their governance. They're also the same organization that is currently suing Graham Township for violating the rights of PGE to put in the injection well in their community. So the same organization says, yes, your local law is valid. We're going to honor that. We're going to revoke the permit, but we're also going to sue you for having that local law so that we can give that permit back to PGE so that they can put the injection well in. So it's like, it's kind of a crazy scenario because it's like, does this organization know what they're even doing? Like, do these people <laughs> yeah. talk to each other? Yeah. It's yeah. like insane. And it's like a very weird situation that you wouldn't think would come up, but that's, you know, the reality of it. And, you know, kind of going back a little bit to like rights of nature and how it can be useful. You know, we're kind of seeing this like smattering of rights of nature's cases, you know, popping up around the country. And it hasn't seen a lot of traction yet because I think we're still hung up on, you know, the fact that corporations have more rights in this country than its citizens do. And then if if corporations, according to our Constitution, have more rights than our citizens, how are we going to be able to justify that nature has the same level of rights that any of us do? And so that was a big problem in this case where, you know, PGE, the corporation, has the right to install an injection well in this community, even though the community doesn't want it. It's like, who has more rights? And the government says, it's the corporation that has more rights. Yeah, that is, you highlight such an important issue in um, the 21st century here in the U.S. And I think that it's it's excellent that you have made this, this, it's actually, it's a lovely film from an artistic standpoint. It's great from science communication and a lesson in civics, but it's also a tool for basically educating people about the challenges and the urgency and the importance of prioritizing things that matter to individuals and their local communities and the ecosystems that that we inhabit. So it brings me to, I kind of want you to look into your crystal balls because, you know, don't we all have a wonderful crystal ball these days with so much chaos in the last few years? Um, but what do you think, and Justin, the first part's directed at you here, um, and then Annie, if you want to add some some stuff to this, feel free. But Justin, what do you think that the future holds for, let's bring it back to the hellbenders, uh, for species like the hellbenders and the hellbenders themselves? Um, what, what do you see coming down the pipeline? <laughs> nice pun there. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Always. I mean, I kind of take a more hopeful approach to things where I believe that like, you know, when, you know, the, the rights of resource management and land rights and stuff go back to like the people who truly deserve them and manage things properly. You know, I think that we can build a world where animals like the hellbender will be protected and natural resources that are around the area will be protected and sustainably managed and stuff like that. But with the system we have now where it's like just driven so heavily by corporations and profit and all that kind of stuff, it just really puts that at risk. Um, and so, you know, the purpose of this film was to promote rights of nature because we're kind of seeing this moment here where we might right be on the cusp of it being more useful um, in our legal framework to allow those communities to maintain control over their, their rights. And so, you know, we're still very far away. Like I mentioned, we're still trying to figure out citizens and corporations rights, but like, you know, if we can light a fire to get more communities, like thinking about rights of nature and like how it could be useful in their legal frameworks to maintain those rights to their environment, we're hoping that that'll kind of like spread amongst a lot of people. And then with that sort of a movement, we'd be able to afford those protections to hellbenders, to snails, to crayfish, to trees, to, you know, all the things that we live off of. Like, <laughs> you know, we need oil, we need gas, we need this. But what we really need is air and water and clean food. We've lived off of that for millions of years and we've lived off of oil and gas off of a hundred years. Yeah. So it's like, as a species, we were much more successful 
without this kind of stuff, taking care of the land, taking care of hellbenders. And now we're just in this profit motive where it's like, oh, we got to get profit, 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 expand, explore, do all this kind of stuff to our detriment. And if we start losing those things that have allowed us to survive for millions of years, then we're going to have a huge issue as a species. Right. And so Annie, like, do you, do you see, do you see anything that, uh, that is different than what Justin just explained or, or just any, like, what do you think is happening when humans are encroaching further and further into these, these ecosystems and for good or for bad? I mean, what, what do you see? Sounds a little harsh, but I, I think you can only step on people for so long when everyone starts getting sick and there's no good places to live. You corporations won't be able to do the things they're doing. They can dump with impunity all over the United States and, I, I mean, in a perfect world, it would be so hard for them to dump anything because of so many regulations that it wouldn't be profitable. I would love that. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, the opposite is true. It is so, it's the cheapest, best option for them to dump all their waste, so many different fossil fuel industries and like other industries like farming and stuff. But, um, you know, we make films uh, to have an impact. And for this one, we want people to realize that they have rights to... Uh, protect themselves, even if it's really, really hard to defend those rights and to make them happen. So, I mean, there's so many bad things going on right now, but I want people to get mad and get organized. So then that dovetails into, I was going to say, so give us the current status um, as much as you can, uh, you know, there in Grant Township, Forksville, that whole area. Um, what is happening on the ground um, with the in mind that this episode is going to air in May, 2023. So it can be, you know, spring 2023. Where are we? Yeah. So the situation right now is their case, you know, the lawsuit continued and it went to the Commonwealth court and it was heard in that court. And it was determined that they did not have the right to use rights of nature to prevent the installation of this injection. Well, and so the community of Grant Township appealed that decision and wanted it to go to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania actually um, decided not to hear that case. And so that case is going back to the Commonwealth Court where it was previously uh, struck down. So, you know, that, that court case hasn't been scheduled yet. We still don't know when that's going to be. But we're kind of in this position where it already lost in one court, went to another, got rejected. Now it's back in this court. What's going to happen? And the feeling is, you know, it's most likely not going to side the way that we want it to side. And so, you know, it's the unfortunate thing about it is if that's the case, then it would end up being like a lot of other rights of nature cases that have been put forth in the court in this country where it's, they strike it down. They say it's not constitutional. So we're really hoping to, you know, do what we can to help support the community going into that court case to where, you know, if it's not, you know, the result that we're looking for, where do we go? What do we do? What's the next step to keep this thing going? Because there's been so much momentum over the last 10 years of this, that it would really be sad for it to end with that. And so that's kind of where we're at now. Um, so by May of 2023, I'm sure the court case won't be scheduled yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll be kind of trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, but for us, we're still going to be doing a lot of screenings with Hellbent and doing community events and stuff and trying to do some community organizing to really get people, you know, to understand and you know, if these court cases and these rights of nature cases start going off like fireworks all over the place, like something's got to stick and it brings that precedent back. We're like, well, it's stuck there. And then that's going to be like the match that just lets it go. And so we were hoping that this is the case. It still could be. Uh, but at the moment, you know, things don't look that hopeful. So then um, that just makes me want to ask real quick, um, is there any specific action that like, let's say some of our listeners are motivated and really want to do something to support this effort? Um, what can they do? Um, do you have any concrete steps they can take or, um, or just even general would be, would be helpful, I think. 
Right now, we have um, a link on our website, and we're doing this in person. We have made postcards addressed to uh, the people of Grand Township, and they have community meetings every week. So, and they read letters from people. So, if you want to say something, some words of encouragement for them, or like give them some advice, come to a screening and fill it out, or go to our website and fill one out. It will get to them, and they will read it. We're trying to get additional ones set up so you can uh, contact people from PGE or this Commonwealth Court, that's proving a little more difficult. We're going to get there. But for now, if you want to talk to uh, the wonderful women in our film, go to our website or come to one of our screens. All right, plug the website then. You got you to give us the URL. Do, do everything. Where can we find you? <laughs> go to hellbentfilm.com. All right. I love it. That's a really easy to remember name. So genius move, uh, whoever picked that URL. Hellbentfilm.com. You heard it here. Um, so then... We are the Union of Concerned Scientists. And I, you know, as a scientist, I have many, many concerns. And you both are scientists and science communicators and artists and, uh, and conservationists. And so I want to ask, and I would like you each to answer, um, we'll have Justin start it off though, so Annie can bring it home. Um, why are you concerned? I'm concerned because kind of like I mentioned before, you know, humans are interlinked with the environment around us. This is where we live. This is how we live. And every animal, every species that we encounter is important to our survival. And when we start losing those little bits, we start losing our footing in our ability to survive as a species. And so kind of the trend that we're heading into right now is that we're, you know, putting you know, luxuries and profits and stuff above our ability to survive in this habitat. And so that's what makes me concerned is that, you know, if we start losing these wild spaces, losing these wildlife populations, losing these beautiful habitats, we're going to start losing ourselves. And by not protecting it and not making those, those moves to give rights to the people who deserve those rights to manage those resources and everything, we're doing ourselves a huge disservice. You know, we have this we're kind of at this point now as a society where we have two options. We can walk off a cliff or we can invest in the right technology and the right legal framework and the right economies to like make it so that we can prolong our survival. Um, and it's kind of an exciting time because, you know, we're trying to like build the understanding that we're at that crossroads and we could take one path, but we're headed towards another. And we all want to see ourselves as a society go to the path where we choose to be sustainable and, um, come up with these green technologies that allow us to continue to live uh, the best we can. Um, and so that's kind of why that's what motivates me to make films like this and tell stories like this, because that kind of like, if we can get as many people on board with understanding how we interact with the wild world around us, we can start moving towards the other path. Excellent answer. All right, Annie, why are you concerned? Um, I think that capitalism has made everyone on earth extremely sick. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in just in a general sense, like we're selling so many aspects of our natural environment for nothing. Fracking is barely even profitable. It's making their workers sick. It's making the people near it sick. It's making the animals who are affected by it sick. For what? Like a little bit of natural gas. There are other sources of natural gas. We don't have to do it this way. If it was, we, if you made it even a little less profitable, you could dispose of the waste more responsibly. We are poisoning the planet for nothing. And I hate that. I hate it so much. I love animals. I love every single animal. And the idea that kids are going to be born on this planet not knowing all the animals that I got to meet makes me sick. So um, for our own health, for the healthy environment, we need to stop this like nonsense, super capitalistic exploitation of the planet. Lovely. Extremely well said. And I think what you just touched on there really, um, it, it brings home something that I've been talking about with a few of my colleagues. It's that you can look at all this, you can look at what's happening and be really, really sad. I mean, it is sad when we lose species, when we lose anything, because the world is such a unique and beautiful and multifaceted place. Uh, and we barely understand it. <laughs> We're just starting to scratch the surface of, of knowledge here. Um, but then a lot of times that sadness basically gets sublimated into anger and sadness is incapacitating, but anger is motivating. So <laughs> I'm uh, it sounds like 
you two are, are motivated to make a change and the whole community in your wonderful film Hellbent was motivated to make change. So I think that's kind of what I'm taking away from our conversation is that uh, there are very powerful motivating factors at work here that hopefully can push back against the kind of devastation that we see far too often. So I really appreciate you both taking the time with me and uh, and being here today and best of luck with the film. And I will do whatever I can to get the word out because I think it's it truly does have the potential to be world changing. And that matters so, so much. So thank you both. Thank you so much, Jess. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having us on the show. Always. You can come back anytime. We'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs>